Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I am your host, Bill Brewster. As always, thank you for tuning in. This episode features Richard Cook of Cook & Bynum. Richard is a concentrated investor that is currently focused on EM. He can go anywhere. He's global, but seems to me to, that the current focus is on EM. You can listen to the interview and decide for yourself. Anyway, I have gotten to know Richard now for, I don't know, probably close to a year. Maybe it's a little bit shorter than that, but it's been very fun getting to know him. I hope that you are interested in the conversation. He drops a fair amount of great nuggets. I don't know. I like this conversation a lot. I hope you like it. As always, nothing in this program is investment advice. All of this is for entertainment purposes only. Do your own due diligence, consult your financial advisor before making investment decisions, and anything that Richard said on this interview, he can change his mind, and he has no duty to update you or come on this program to let you know. So that's that, and enjoy the show. Before this music drops, I do want to give a shout out to my editing team at Speech Docs. You can find them on Twitter at Speech, and Docs is D-O-C-S. Dax and his team is are fantastic. I met them, well, I was introduced to them when I was on Value After Hours. They've done Toby's work, at least on the transcript side. I don't know about editing the pod because those pods are normally dropped live. However, I moved from the podcast consultant to speech docs, and the transition has been, I would argue, seamless. I hope that you as listeners have not noticed a difference. And all I can say is that Dax and his team offer incredibly good value and they're very responsive. And I very much appreciate what they do on the back end of this show. So if you are somebody who is thinking about starting a podcast, please consider Dax and his team at Speech Docs. That's S-P-E-E-C-H-D-O-C-S. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Cook from Cook and Bynum. Thank you very much for joining the show, sir. How are you? Doing great. Great to be with you, Bill. It's nice to do this. Last time we saw each other was in New York. That was a, a decently fun panel, I think. Oh, yeah. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks for leading that. I tried. I tried my best. There was a lot of <clears throat> discussion about like governments and following election results. The more so than I thought there might be, but I don't know if that's just a function of what you have to follow when you're in EM investing or not. Well, I think the course of governments matter, and I think they matter for more for some businesses than they matter for other businesses. I think a lot of the trading that happens in emerging markets is sort of event driven around the elections because mm -hmm. that's kind of the the amount of attention and focus that people have, and I think there's less. One of the things that's attracted to us about searching for names in emerging markets is there's less fundamental analysis and good business analysis work happening. But I mean, certainly governments matter. They matter more in some countries than others. Like if China wants to do something, they do it. In Peru, the government's pretty small and mm -hmm. pretty ineffective. So kind of capitalism happens regardless if the government wants it or not. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that there, but also when we think about the businesses we buy, we think about how sensitive they are to a big shift to the left or a big shift to the right and new administrations. And I think that that's a important part of the underwriting process. In the U.S. as well, I think you see, find the same thing in the U.S., but uh, um, certainly it's something to think about when you're... Yeah. For those that don't know, because we're jumping right into emerging, you tend to be skewed emerging right now, but I mean, you, you have disclosed a, an investment in AB InBev that has a substantial amount of US cash flow. So, and I don't think that you started as emerging, right? So it's not necessarily by design. It's sort of an, an outcome of a process or is it by design? Well, we've been doing, you know, we've had global unconstrained, go anywhere, concentrated mandate since we started back in 2001, we're coming up, our anniversary is coming up in a couple of weeks, we'll be 23 years in. So we started out, of course, because 
that was our base of knowledge and our circle of competence in the U.S. I had a couple of mentors that really encouraged us starting in 2005 to look at emerging markets because they said there's less people with your skill set there. Hmm. And, and that there's more of an opportunity to have an edge if you do the type of work that we do. So that's not sufficient. But in that time period in the late 2000s, valuations got pretty expensive in emerging markets relative to the United States. So we had some positions that worked fairly well and then our exposure shrunk. And then maybe this has been too soon, but maybe the last five years or so, our exposure has increased as the relative valuations with the U.S. have gotten more extreme. So, but we have, we continue to have the same philosophy, but we continue to have a strategy that is global unconstrained. But then we also have a flavor that is just emerging markets, excluding China. And when you, you say, you said global unconstrained and concentrated. So that leads to two questions. Your top, I, I'm going to say eight holdings, because I don't even know if they're 10, consist of how much of the portfolio? 100%. Okay. And how many investments have you made since inception over your 23 years? We've made 40 investments in 23 years. So you would say you're a little bit longer term than the street? Um, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we try to think like business owners and we approach management as long-term oriented business owners. And I think our average holding period has been about five years. We have delivered, we've not delivered a lot of short-term capital gains to investors over the years. We're conscious of transaction costs, and especially thinner things that could be smaller, but mainly we like to buy a business, assume that it's not going to trade again. And are we happy with the result? So then we're not in a trap of trying to guess what sentiment's going to be or who's going to buy this from us later or whatever. We can just compound capital with the internal rate of return of that business. And, uh, you know, there's of course other, other pieces of that, but that's our, our time horizon is we, we go into something, assuming we're going to own it forever. Maybe best case, the stock goes up a lot in the first, you know, 12 months in one day, and then we can sell it and, and earn a much higher return than we expected. But. It could go the other way. It could be that the sentiment goes more negative, but we're, you know, we're, we're underwriting to a cash flows or, or to owner earnings that we expect the business to generate over time. So we were talking about before we, we hopped on when the stock price does go the other way and, and it's going against you. One of the things that you've written about in the past is how powerful buybacks at levels below intrinsic value can be over the long term. But I thought a wrinkle that you put in your analysis that was interesting that I'd love to hear you riff on is how a controlling shareholder can help that situation. Yeah. I mean, I've seen a number of, you know, a lot of the businesses that we've owned, we own now and we've owned historically have had controlling shareholders. I think that that suits us since we have a long time horizon. We like, if we like the partners, we think we have to underwrite them and make sure they're people we want to be in business with. But if we like them, it can be an advantage because they are focused on 10 year horizons and longer and not on my stock options are expiring and I need to get the stock up to, or whatever. The, I think of there's a different places you have different cultures around buybacks and different tax incentives, but I can, I won't name the company, but I can think about a conversation I had with a large U S business with a controlling shareholder. And the CEO was talking about how he's going to get his valuation up and sort of upset that his valuation multiple wasn't more like some other business that he admired. And I said to him, I said, you have a controlling shareholder that I think they own almost nearly half the business. You're buying back stock aggressively every day. Why do you want it's in the benefit of your controlling shareholder if the valuation goes down? I mean, the multiple goes down, not the intrinsic value, but the multiple goes down. It's really powerful. So I think the letter you're referencing, it was sort of came out of that discussion mm. with him, but in my mind, sort of shame on his controlling shareholders for creating a fault, a bad incentive for him, that he wasn't focused on building intrinsic value per share Yeah, because that that's where he should be when you can think about different proxies to make that, to test that in your comp agreement. But we see that all the time that we see. Lots of companies buying shares above intrinsic value or trying to get their stock up and thinking short term, they'll, they'll do transactions. Oh, if we did this, we'll get price more like that. Or if we list here, we'll get this multiple instead of the multiple we have. And 
a lot of time and energy and money is wasted on things. And I'm always like, well, just make a better product, satisfy your consumer, your, your customer better, you know, be more efficient, find ways to save money. Those are the, those are the things that we're more interested in when, when we are talking to management teams. Yeah. Well, the, the letter that I was actually thinking of, the comment that you had put in that I thought was quite insightful. And one, one of those that when you read it, it's like, oh, that's common sense. I wish that I had uh, written that. But it was that the controlling shareholder protects you from a take under. Mm, oh, yeah, that's a good point. And it, well, you made it. <laughs> it's very smart, right? <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> that guy I've is never heard such a great insight. <laughs> no, I mean, that is fair. I mean, you do deal with companies where their stock is down and it makes them vulnerable. But if you have a controlling shareholder, that's not a risk. Yeah. So that should give you more courage. To, I mean, I talk to, we'll frequently meet with companies and this doesn't sound as quite as crazy in an emerging market as it does in the U.S., but we're like, I'll ask them at the end of a meeting, why do you have an investor relations team? What is the goal of your IR effort? And I think usually the answer to that is their goal is to get the stock price up. Hmm. It's like a sales effort. And where we're much more drawn to companies that have no investor relations that, you know, don't report in English or, or that or not, I mean, where they're there just to provide information, perhaps they're accessing the debt market and they need to have an investor relations team in order to improve their yields. I mean, that's a good answer, but you know, if the IR effort is really around, not just communicating accurately with investors, but trying to get the stock up, you can figure that out pretty quick and not never would we get involved in those companies, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely means there's probably a difference in sort of values about what their goals are from what our goals are. What are some of the tells that you've seen over time that investor relations is kind of there for the multiple? Well, sometimes they'll basically will say it. Hey, do you know any conferences we can go to where we can reach a lot of new investors? Or if they're, I mean, I get emails from investor relations teams like, hey, look at our stock. Yeah, I mean, that's just the worst kind of case. But with the way they communicate, how frank are they? When you go back and read the way they communicated two years ago and four years ago, how does it compare? Are they quick to say that this or that is temporary or it needs to be adjusted out or, or whatever? And then, and maybe it does, maybe it is a one-off event, but how does that, what does that kind of sniff test say about what the reality is? And uh, so I don't think it's that hard if everybody's walked in a, a car dealership and gotten gotten pushed hard to buy something and other times you walk. But we've also dealt with some really wonderful people on the best investor relations teams, besides just not having one, I would say the best teams are looking for ideas. They're accessing people that are following their industry seriously, and they're looking to gather information from you that they can convey to their CFO or their CEO to help them better manage the business. Hmm. And I think we've had some, a number of constructive relationships like that over time where as an investor, we have access to every public company and industry in the world, and we will talk to them, we'll follow them, we'll engage with them. And sometimes they can bring competitors and peers and suppliers and customer information to an investor relations team and say, Hey, you know, they're, they're doing this there. And, and it seems to be working. Like this is an opportunity for you. Or we're seeing this trend and it may be a headwind for you. Think about how you can get ahead of it. Just sort of be a part of the cross pollinization of, of information. And I think with that, you can build, uh, build a, you know, if you're useful to them, if they view you as useful, then they'll, they'll, I, I think that you're, there are more reasons for them to talk to you and you have a better seat at the table about something else that you want to influence, you know, in the last several months we've had two of our ceos come to alabama to see us we talk to our our management teams frequently when just about without exception and um, i think because we are focused on the long run and maybe we're encouraging them to their um sort of better angels to not listen to what some investment maker has in their ear about the short term but to think about the long term i think that the right management teams want that they want that feedback. And so it could be, hopefully we were able to add value that way. Just maybe how to run this business, do it the way that you think is best. Don't ignore the noise. Yeah. And, and So you write a lot about bias and avoiding bias. And how do you think about 
the sort of juxtaposition of getting to know a management team and the bias that that can create and remaining rational while being engaged. I think that gets to your personal disposition a little bit. I, I mean, I know investment managers that don't want to know manager teams because they sort of, well, manager teams are good salespeople and I'm going to be biased. I, I mean, I think it's really an important question. I think you can, I certainly have seen investment managers get suckered in by charismatic leaders. And uh, I can't think of where we've done that. And I'm just thinking through our 40 investments, but I, I'll probably will think, reflect on this tonight and think of one or two where maybe we weren't as objective as we can be. I mean, I've certainly... We try to avoid bias, but we're certainly not immune. So, I mean, Charlie Munger talks about avoiding your fair share of folly, and maybe that's a that should all be our goal. Um, but maybe we, whenever there's new information about a business, we try to re-underwrite it from scratch. You know, like we have models, of course, that we carry along, but I frequently will, you know, open up a spreadsheet and sort of think about the business totally anew. Hmm. And so kind of refreshing all the time, which is as if you didn't know anything is, is important. I would also say that we have a culture here that is different than a lot of other places that I've been exposed to and that I encourage everybody on the team, not just the research team, but everybody on the team to be able to say both sides of every question, but like on, in the context of research, you know, I don't want us to have a pitch and defend culture where someone owns a stock, they present a stock, they get it in the portfolio, they're their bonus is tied to the results of that particular stock. And then that creates this incentive for them to hide information about that company and only give you the best information. It's really helpful if we spend six months on an idea and then we find one point that makes us not want to invest, like that should be encouraged just as much. And I, I want everybody here to be able to tell, Hey, Richard, you're an idiot. You're thinking about that the wrong way, or you hadn't thought about this or, and Hey, this is important, but this is also important. They're counter to each other. I want us to be seeking the truth wherever that is. And that hopefully reduces some of the bias that, that can creep into any kind of investing, but it's certainly not foolproof, but that's the best I got is to, you know, keep, you know, it's like if you write a paper and then you put it aside, you read it again the next day, you'll make improvements. Yep. Yep. And so. Those types of ways of tricking yourself into rethinking. Well, someone else has got a bearish view on it. Let, let's be able to explain the bearish view. How, why do they get to that point? How do they think that way? Can we challenge their assumptions? Can we disprove that? You know, how do we rub our nose? And, and then another thing we do is kind of imagine a priori. And this is kind of our thesis about this business. We think they're going to do this. Let's kind of write that down, think about it. And then as events unfold, how did it turn out? If we were expecting this to disprove our thesis, we have a test already out there. And then that happens harder for us to stick with it. Yeah. So, and we try to do that both the opposite way too. We actually do that with the things we don't do, which is the long list of things we should have done that we thought about doing that we didn't do. Oh, you mean but like, hey, we were worried about like mistakes of, or errors of omission almost? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm constantly, uh, somebody is digging up from our team's chat from eight years ago where I said, we were worried about this. We thought this was going to go that way and it didn't go that way. And this worked out better than we thought. Huh. And sometimes it's, we were worried about something and that's exactly what happened. But, but also sometimes it's, you know, we were worried about this and maybe we were too worried about that. What can we learn from that? Or has it just been lucky that it didn't work out that way and that, or it hasn't worked out that way yet. So I, I don't know, trying to redo decisions with postmortems is, is a, frequent part of our, of what we're doing. Well, I shouldn't say you make few decisions. There is not much activity in your portfolio. So I would think that making sure that you're not falling in love with an investment just because you've owned it for a number of years is a skill set that maybe has to be developed. Yeah. I mean, we've made some mistakes by holding on to things. We've also made mistakes by getting rid of things. I mean, we've lost more money by selling things too soon. Um, for sure. Um, seems to be a common so refrain. A, it could be a comment on where we are in a market cycle. Yeah, well, that's true, but I've, we've been through a few cycles, yeah. so I don't, it's not just this cycle. And we, we, we first started our business, we bought tractor supply company. Oh yeah. You and, told me uh, this. And it quadrupled 
and we sold it, thought we were geniuses. Um, and then I think it's up more since we sold it than the S and P or anything else. You want to tell people right. how cheap you bought it? We bought it. I don't know the split adjusted. I can't give you all that, but we paid about seven times earnings for it. It was a double digit grower. The CEO owned about 15% of the business and he was buying stock in the open market. They had, so I can't do the split adjusted, but they had about 40% of the stock, half the stock value in expanded working capital. Basically they had put in a new inventory system that failed and they had no idea how much inventory was in their stores. And they made the decision to, that they didn't want their customers to come to the store and leave dissatisfied. So they just pushed inventory into their store. So if you went and visited a store, they'd have seven wooden ax handles and seven synthetic ax handles, and they probably needed one or two. Um, and that was true across every category. So they knew that they needed to get a picture of their inventory and they needed to, they needed to pull that, go back to a more normalized inventory, which I think the inventory turns to drop to two and they would have been three and a half before. And, uh, so if you just sort of took their inventories back to three and a half, you were paying like three times earnings, but I think we lacked, I mean, we thought it was a decent business. We've always skeptical of retail, although that's been a place we've done a lot of things. We didn't have one in Birmingham yet at that point. We visited some in Tennessee and uh, Nebraska and a few other places, but we lacked, shame on us, a good lesson. We lacked an understanding that this was a very good standalone format. They could be near a Walmart or near a Home Depot. It could be just fine. I think we were worried about their SKUs getting competed away from them by the big boxes. And that was unwarranted. They wound up their biggest competitor went bankrupt. They bought a hundred of their big competitors. They had about, I said, I read around 300 stores at the time. They bought, Pichiri picked the best hundred stores from one of their competitors and converted them to their format and went on to have a ton of success. I mean, obviously it's been a tremendous success story. I wish we had been along. I wish we had stayed with the ride because we know kind of red stake, redneck companies. Tractor Supply really was, is a, store for people that pretend to be farmers and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you I know. had to go on for my dog or I had to go there for my dog. Yeah. 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 And so truck boxes and fence posts and some of the things, I mean, there, it's definitely, you know, but my mother certainly resembles that. And I do too, as someone that likes to be in the country. And so it's a business we should have been able to understand really well. I think we understood it well. And we lost a lot of money because we didn't understand it. Didn't understand their offer better. Do you think that has anything to do with, I perceive what you saw was a balance sheet issue. And then it sort of transitioned to growth earnings power machine. Do you think some of that was because you were focused so much on the inventory sort of normalizing? And once that sort of played out, it was like, okay, well now it's close to fair value. So we're, we're sort of done here. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think we felt like we'd made the easy money and that it was going to get harder for them because retail is hard and we were worried that at that point, Walmart and Home Depot and Lowe's were still growing pretty rapidly. And we thought as they grew that that would, they, I guess we did, we lacked the imagination to see how big the white space was for a tax block company. And, and in our defense, we were 23 at the time, but we were still learning investing. But if you have a retailer that has a pretty fast payback period for opening a new store, two years, two and a half years, and they have. I think they thought, I think their estimate at the time was they thought they had room for like 800 stores in the country. They have way more than that now. So they were too conservative in that number. And I think we probably trusted that. I don't know why we trusted it per se, but we, we lacked the imagination to see how big it could be. They also were very focused on the sort of upper income rural areas. You know, they mm. were like horse, the count of horses yep. was an important number for them for locating a store because that's going to locate gentlemen farmers when it turns out the stores work pretty well if it's you know cattle it's not just where you don't have a lot of horses interesting yeah it works pretty well in the less sort of gentrified country areas as well hmm. and i'm not sure they do that yet but they look they did a fantastic job of managing the business and and growing it and so i give them a lot of credit and i wish we had been stayed on for the ride longer but maybe I don't know. Maybe if we'd spent more time in Tennessee, we could have figured that out. Maybe if they'd had a store here, we could have figured that out. Or maybe we were just too immature as investors to figure that out. But a lot of good, from a success for us, a lot of good lessons. But it was fun. I'm glad, I mean, certainly happy 
we had the result we did. That was very helpful to the for our business growing at the beginning. I'm just thinking about, okay, well, even if you had held tractor supply uh, company, what would that have been like in 08? Which gets me to what was that period generally like to manage for you? And, and where were you focused at the time as a portfolio? Yeah. So we actually did a little better than average in 08, which um, I credit to not any sort of, just because we tend to own higher quality businesses, we tend to own businesses that are less cyclical. And also I'd say an important thing in that period is that we got net new money from our investors, the family that is our largest investor now added money to us in the fourth quarter of 08, the first quarter of 09. Mm. So that's really, I think Seth Klarman talks about how important it is to have good investors, to be a good manager. And I think that is understated, under less under understood. It's more important than people realize. And so we've had having the confidence and support of investors that think like business owners and that see down drafts as opportunities is really enabling. I reflect on that period. My wife and I agreed to not give each other Christmas presents that year. Um, and cause we wanted to get every dollar we could into the market. Mm. I mean, I think we, we understood in real time, uh, Dow and I did that this was a generational opportunity and the valuations were really stupid and that you could find businesses that were not going to go under because of the financial crisis and you could buy them very attractive, very attractive. And so we worked really hard to get our capital into things. And we did have a, a very good period in 09 as well. So we did kind of over that whole cycle was a very good period for us, but on a relative basis and not bad on an absolute basis. I mean, we made over that period, we did well. We, my regrets, I, I think we wrote a letter at the end of 09 where we talked about our mistakes and uh, despite having a really good year. And I think about the things that we thought were very cheap that we hadn't done enough work on yet hmm. and to have the information adequacy that we needed. Um, I think about, and so one of our lessons of that was keep stockpiling things that you've done the work on. You don't know when they're going to get cheap. You don't know. Cause it happens when it happened in that period, it was a fairly short period and we did the best we could. We got our money into things that we were not going to invest in things we don't know well. And we had a good result. So I'm not, um, but there were other things that we thought were almost certainly going to be really good that we didn't put our money in because we hadn't done enough work. We hadn't been like, for example, there were a few companies in Chile that we wanted to buy, hmm. but we hadn't been there yet. But we've been there 10 times since because we did want to be prepared for the next time there was a downdraft like that. We wanted to be able to do those things. And so we keep building our watch list and of companies that we can get up to speed on very quickly, even if we're not following them every single day, because we want to be, if there is a panic, or I think our best performing physician in the last couple of years is one that we first met with more than a decade ago, like 12, 14 years ago. And it went from 30 something times earnings to seven. And then we bought it. Hmm. And, but we talked to them several times along the way. We visited them. And you see, you just never quite know when something's going to become attractive. But if the business has got good characteristics, we can throw it in our watch list. We can put alerts on it relative to multiples and different things. And hopefully it will they will bubble back. And that, that's the cumulative part of this game. What kind of underlying series of events has a stock moved from 30 times earnings to seven? Yeah, maybe that's a theme that we look for sometimes. So the company is based in Turkey. And so Turkey went from a place that everyone was very excited about the prospects of Turkey to total panic about, and legitimately so, about Erdogan and the consolidation of power and the hyperinflation and different things that are going on there. But one lesson we had learned in a different situation that we kind of model that we look for is if you have a business that's domiciled somewhere, or trade somewhere, but a majority of the business is outside of that country, then it could be an interesting place to when there's panic or low bad perceptions of the economy or the country or the valuations or whatever, you could buy, you could pick off a company where you you feel like I'm buying the international business even if it goes to zero here, I got protection in the case of this company, all of the sub international subsidiaries roll up to Dutch subsidiaries. Hmm. So even if they were to totally steal the Turkish business from us, which I, I, think, I don't think that's likely uh, by the way, but we still thought it was very cheap. And so we wound up paying six or seven times earnings for a company that's growing 
probably going to grow underlying volumes in the mid to high single digits for a long time and probably going to go profits in the high single digits to low double digits for a couple decades and well-run, good controlling shareholders, good governance. Um, and but people loved it because of those fundamentals and then they hated it because they just wanted to sell everything after an election. And maybe all the way back to the top of our conversation, I think there is frequently too much focus on elections and sort of macro ETF trading dump a country. Yeah. And then maybe another thing that we've seen is that when there's an election that moves more socialist leaning, that is a favorite headline, particularly in Latin America where we've done a lot of things. That is a favorite headline. English speaking press will run and sort of tell a, a Castro narrative and overlay that on any given country. Huh. Um, and then when it doesn't really work out because the country, and, there, and there's big differences between countries in Latin America, but if the country is actually kind of capitalist in its root in terms of the, what, the, what the voters want, and that government becomes very unpopular, they don't actually, and the institutions are somewhat strong and they don't actually implement a lot of socialism. I mean, the economy does okay. Nobody goes back and writes the story. Yeah. It's, it's there in the local press, but it's there in Spanish in that case, but it's not in... It never comes back in the English press and investors don't come back until like the next election when they turn back to the, to the right. And then, and then money will flood in. Yeah. Um, so this is what a so, friend of the pod, Ian Bizek was talking about with Columbia. He was like, look, everybody thinks that, that this president is, is a big lefty, but if you look, he's lost the support of our country. So he can't really do that much anymore. And yeah, I mean, you can mess up some things. I, I noticed their uh, their EMP company or whatever. They're kind of driving some policy from the top to make them more ESG or whatever. But that's that's not a long term issue, right? That's maybe a, another year and a half issue. So, what does the next ten to twenty look like? Is probably a more important question. Yeah, I've seen this story a bunch of times. I would stop short of predicting what's going to happen in Colombia because I'm not quite as close to that one, but I definitely have seen that theme. I mean. If you look at COVID, I mean, the country, the large country that had the smallest amount of deficit spending in order to deal with the COVID crisis was probably Mexico. Hmm. So AMLO, the socialist, was more fiscally responsible than Trump or any other government you can find, essentially, in a large country. And because he was obsessed with protecting the peso. Hmm. And so that was really, there is a kind of thread of, in Latin America, there's a thread of socialist leaders that will reference communism, socialism, Bolivarianism, but they will be governed by some practicality. And, um, and I certainly think AMLO just done some things that they were very bad for Mexico. I certainly wouldn't endorse them, but not necessarily terrible for business and, and, and terrible for the people of Mexico. If you have sort of as an anchor, I'm going to keep the peso from falling apart. Do you think and, that's because uh, they've seen other Latin American countries lose their currency? So it's sort of front and center. Yeah. I mean, the Latin American debt crisis is still in the minds of people that are over 50 in Latin America. And they, they certainly are co conscious of that. There's no question. And the countries and the companies are much more so than then to the extent that they have leverage it's it's in local currency they're not they don't have a whole bunch of dollarized debt in general and so they're better protected from those outcomes you also these countries some of these countries have 40 to 50 percent debt to gdp and which is not nothing but it's a lot lower than most of any of the western company countries so i, I don't know I, I i i think it's good that they if the currency is a check on deficit spending. I think that's a really good thing for the people in those countries and for the economies and, and ultimately the businesses that we that we look at. Yeah, interesting. Is it fair to say you specialize in bottlers? Or is that not well, it's certainly fair? A, well, it's an important part of our portfolio now. It's an industry that we've been involved with since 2006. It's a big part of our portfolio now and one hopefully we have some expertise. I think you do, but I, I didn't know if I should say that you specialize in it. That might be a little bit too narrow of a word to assign. Yes, I think specialize is too. 
I would, I would stop short of saying we specialize because I do like a lot of the characteristics of it, but I also can imagine a future where their valuations don't support our having maybe any position at all. So what do um, you like so much about those businesses? Or, or, well, I mean, I think, what do you like about the characteristics of it? I shouldn't say so much, but when we talked about it once, I thought it was very interesting. Like you're, you're in the weeds on it and it's fun to talk about. Well, we are in the weeds. So keep me from going too deep and, and boring your listeners. But I think one thing in general in emerging markets, Coca-Cola has a higher brand equity than relative to competitors than it does in the U S. So you have to think about Pepsi as a B brand in Latin America and frequently at a 10 to 25% price discount. I thought about you a lot, not in a weird way, but I was in Costa Rica and I was talking to the people down there and they, they think Pepsi's like dirt water. Yeah. It's very different. I mean, I mean, I'm in Alabama, which is of course close to Atlanta and where Coca-Cola bread equity is relatively higher than if you were in New York or somewhere where Pepsi's got more of a following or in Texas where Dr. Pepper's got more of a following, but the bread equity difference is bigger in Latin America. It was wild. Um, I, I went into the little mom and pops. I only saw one little spe- uh, Pepsi stand, and it wasn't even as you drink a Coke. I like it. And and the Pepsi wasn't even frigir- refrigerated. It was just standing there in the middle of the store. Yeah, so I would say the other insight that we stumbled upon back in our first trip to Mexico was that the mom and pops, the informal market, is is a majority of the sales of Coke of the Coke system in Latin America. That's true. I think in almost, if not, maybe if not every country, but virtually every country in Latin America, it's also true in other parts of the world. So that was really interesting that if you have 70, 75% market share, which is not uncommon, and you have this very fragmented route to market. So I think at the time, the numbers we were working with was that Coke was selling about $7,500 per point of sale. And if Pepsi were, which was like 15% market share. If they were to sell to all of those points of sale, they'd be sub a thousand dollars or around a thousand dollars per point of sale. So that math doesn't let them get to all of those points of sale. So you have a lot of smaller mom and pops where there is no Pepsi available. You get to a mid-sized mom and pop and Coke has put a cooler in as you witnessed. Um, and they had their product cold in first position and they typically have a hot uh, replacement shelf next to it with their products there taking second position. And then Pepsi, if they have a cooler, it's in third position, but frequently they won't have a cooler in that, in that second, that third position. So now I'm competing with cold Coke versus hot Pepsi. Hmm. And then if I get to a large amount of pop, the Pepsi is going to be there in a cooler for sure. But like I said, I'm in first position. I'm, I'm confronting the customers that come in. The other piece of it is we're doing you know, a third, let's say in Mexico, something like a third of the business is returnables. So I can reuse that bottle 20 to 30 times. So it allows me to price discriminate. You know, if Bill comes in, he's not worried. He's not work looking about to save a quarter. He's going to buy the non-returnable and walk out of there and not worry about where he's going with it. But if I'm, if I'm four guys on a construction crew and we're having lunch and we're are very price conscious, I'm going to pick up the two liter returnable. We're going to split it with cups over lunch, and then I'm going to take it back and get my deposit back Hmm. or turn it in to get the next bottle. And so that ability to price discriminate, I think they have about 20 SKUs of Coca-Cola, just red Coke, regular sugared Coke in Juarez, Mexico, for example, which is one of the top, maybe the top market in the world. Pedros Negros, I think it's actually the number one city in the world for per capita consumption. So that, that returnal, that ability to run a returnable offering and have that be a big part of your volume, I can now sell that two liter returnable at the same price point as the non-returnable Pepsi, but I got a lot more margin in Hmm. it. Or I can sell a one and a half liter at the same price point. And for the consumer that is, is not worried about or need for that use case or whatever there is, they don't, they can't handle the returnable for that use case. And so now if I'm a consumer and I walk in, I can say 25 pesos, get a two liter Coke, returnable, or I can get a two liter non-returnable Pepsi, which I don't like as much, or I can get a one and a half liter non-returnable Coke, depending on what my needs are. I've sort of bracketed that consumer's decision and I can keep people in the brand and I can reinforce this volume, volume dominance, which allows me to continue to control this point of sale. So 
what we found is this execution at the point of sale for the top business, the top brands is a reinforcing. And that's why you see such high market share in a few categories across Latin America and really across a lot of emerging markets in the world that have this large and formal economy. Hmm. And so we like that about the bottling system and that it has kind of a secondary moat beyond the brand equity that is reinforcing because their ability to sell through to this fragmented offering. Well, you write, and, you often write about uh, focusing, like, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm pretty sure these are accurate. Focusing on the moat from the customer's point of view. And as I'm hearing you talk, the interesting thing is the mom and pop gets the refrigerated offering that, that they don't have to worry about coming out of pocket for. And then because of that, you are able to, or not because of that, but because of the scale of the bottler, uh, you're able to serve the end user as well in more interesting ways, right? To, to um, allow them to have more choice. And as that sort of wheel reinforces itself, the, the secondary offering just kind of gets left further and further behind unless they're willing to just lose money to try to capture market share. But if, if you're asking people about the brand and they're telling you it's basically a non-existent thing in their head, then how many years do you have to lose money in order to catch up? And is it worth it to even try? I mean, it's not worth it. And so, and then I think the interesting dynamic is that there are typically, you know, three to five companies that have the scale to distribute to the point to the mom and pops in a country, the brewer or two and the Coke bottler. And then typically there's a couple more group of bimbo is a good one in Mexico, Nutresa in Colombia or, um, Alicorp in Peru, and they'll come to market with a, maybe a whole basket of different products. So then if I'm trying to get to market and I am not at one of those companies, I got to pay them you know, and try to hitch a ride on their truck. But then I don't get the same level of attention. I don't get the same displays. It's, so frequently you're seeing Pepsi get to market on someone else's truck. Hmm. Um, and, but then that interesting question is, okay, now I have the Coke truck or I have the MBAV truck or, or whatever. What else can I put on my truck? And the bottlers in more parts of the world are starting to distribute beer, particularly in Latin America, where the countries are largely Catholic and you don't have any kind of sensitivity about alcohol distribution. You're seeing other products try to get to market that way. And you're also seeing, all right, now I got this relationship with this customer. Our bottler in Mexico has a, has put point of sale machines in these mom and pops. So they have tablets and they're scanning goods and they're keeping track of their inventory. But we also have real time information now of everything that's being sold at that store, including our competitors goods and Hey, what problems can we solve? for this mom and pop can we they'll bring a white truck and deliver other goods for them or can we you know what other, can we help them allow their mom and pop to be access point for the unbanked so that if they need to top up their sim card or they need to pay their utility bill uh, and they have cash can we help provide some of the services for them to help maintain this mom and pop because this mom and pop ecosystem of course has got tension with the more formalized retail and, but since it is a part of our moat, there's good reasons why we want to protect it and help it thrive. So thinking about ways that we can deepen that relationship and make that customer uh, more money so they'll continue to favor us and we can get access to their consumers is, you know, it's, there's a lot of pieces of this. And of course, these people are really good. I mean, it's this outstanding management team and they're thinking about these things all the time. Well, I have no idea if Mexico is similar to what the what I visited in Costa Rica, but I, I thought what was interesting was the guy said we were on sort of a, a tour and he pulled over and he said, this is a typical Costa Rican town. And he said, we put like a, a soccer field in the middle then you've got your houses. And he says, there's a church and then there's a bar and then there's like this store. And to your point, if you are the, the point of contact for the store, and then you can get these insights into how, I mean, you almost, you almost become like integral to the town growing up. Right. And, and if it's possible to help them succeed, it, it's hard to think that they would want to tear you out of their ecosystem. No, and frequently the mom and pops are of course run by a 
respected member of the community in that neighborhood. Yeah. I mean, it's usually somebody in the neighborhood that's running the store. It's not like it's somebody across town or someone that no one knows. And we, they're, you know, part of the data gathering that you're getting from this now is when you think about a mom and pop, what is the proximity of that mom and pop to the soccer field? This um, one was very that close. Determined, yeah, if it is, then we need to have some more of our Powerade in that store. Oh, huh, yeah, you know, that makes it sense. Text the mix. If we're close to a school, we'd have more of a certain mix. If we're close to a church, if we know there's going to be a big community event, a concert, a football, big football match, we know we need more inventory in that store before it. So every time we're out of stock of something at a store, that's lost sales. And every time we don't have the product that the consumer at that store what's the income level of that neighborhood? Is it close to a bus stop, whatever, then we're losing sales. So how do we have the data to predict what would work best at that store? And then how can we show that to that customer? Because all of, all of the inventory is cash on delivery. So I got to convince that, that store owner, that customer, we call him the customer, that, hey, you, if you added energy drinks here, or if you added some other product that's maybe slightly down the, the one or 2% product, we, we, you'll, we think it'll be worth it for you. We think you'll make profits. And so it's, they got to, you got to build that trust with them. And then, but if you can gather the data and, and optimize that, you could, there's more and more opportunities that way too. The other thing that we, that we talked about that I thought was pretty fascinating was, and I'm, I'm going to ask you, you may not have this off the top of your head, but when does a country start to consume soft drinks? Like what's the per capita GDP before people start to drink soft drinks? Well, let's, Maybe let's define it as ready to drink, okay. which is yes. basically anything that's bottled or canned or as opposed to brewing tea out of the tap or something. And somewhere around four or $5,000 is when we see per capita GDP is when we see people really start to adopt ready to drink. Before that, it's too big of a price point for most people, as long as you're not in a place with really bad water quality or something. Hmm. And then that accelerates really to about $20,000 in per capita GDP. And then it starts to taper off. And then you're not going to like, you're not going to see a lot of volume growth in the United States in ready to drink. People can afford to drink ready to drink all kinds of categories. And so what the goal then is to premiumize them. Yeah. You know, and Starbucks has done a splendid job of that, of not necessarily in the ready to drink category, but who knew that everyone needed $5 coffee. Everyone uh, may not. Did. Everyone may not. We'll find out. <laughs> well, see if the new it's CEO. Worked really, uh, yeah. Okay. Ignoring the last, you know, couple of years, yeah. it's been a remarkable yes, story no in the last twenty-five no years. Doubt. And uh, so, how do you premiumize? And of course, the liquor makers are trying to do that. The wine makers are trying to do that. The beer makers are trying to do that. Uh, but there's, they're not. There's only so much liquid that humans are going to put in their stomach. Yeah. So, how big of a percentage of that can you be profitably, and how profitable can you be at it? So we look for, and that they're different kind of S curves like that for different products I and mean, different cultures have different answers to that, but that's something we look for. If we're going to get involved in a business and we're expecting growth and volume, where is this country and what is their current level of consumption of that product? What is sort of possible? And so that's definitely a part of our, our analysis where we also bottle Cokes and, um, Pakistan and Bangladesh and per capita consumption there is for in America, we're a little over 400. So the average American is drinking a little bit more than one eight ounce Coca-Cola company product per day. And, and Piedros Negros, Mexico, the last number I remember is about a thousand. And obviously they're poorer than us, but they have about a thousand. So that's like, I guess what's possible. Wow. Uh, Why is that? Cause the water is not good. Well, part of it's, yeah, part of it's the water is not trusted. That's part of it. But also just culturally, if you go to dinner, and I don't know if you saw this in Costa Rica, but if you go to dinner in Mexico with Mexicans, they will put wine and Coke on the table next to each other. Yeah, huh. It's like, it's just a culturally they think about. It's a aspirational good still. It's absolutely embedded in what people do in a way that maybe espresso drinking is in, 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 in Italy or something. But if you look at like per capita consumption, just to kind of think about this, but I'll give you a couple. Pakistan is, is like 36. Bangladesh is like 20. Huh. Uh, so long runways. So there is long runways. And those are countries that were, there's not a lot of alcohol consumption either because they're Muslim. So there's even when water quality is not always reliable, they're hot places. So 
you certainly can imagine a really long runway first, just to grow volume. And then second, hopefully this good countries continue to grow economically. And then there's opportunity to premise them along the way as well. So when, when you think about, I mean, in some of your letters, you've talked about intrinsic value and, and how much company that can, the durability of a company impacts intrinsic value. How much more are you willing to, to, and I, this one's going to be impossible to answer, but just directionally speaking, how much more are you willing to pay for a company that you feel like you have that much line of sight into future earnings potential versus one that you don't? And I, I don't mean to ask a leading question, but I'm going I'm to stop it there and see where you go, and then I may have a follow-up. Okay, well, I'm anxious for the follow-up, but because I can't really give you a number. I mean, the math is math. Yeah. I would say as a general rule, we we believe capitalism is more relentless at destroying outsized returns on capital than people expect. When you think about some businesses, we'll go back to the 99 period where you had like people making fiber optic cable and making basic switches and stuff, stuff that was pretty repeatable where there wasn't a huge technological advantage, but because there was no, there wasn't enough supply, they made very high returns on capital, but that wasn't durable. And so they, some of those businesses worked out just fine, but they were trading at huge multiples that didn't make sense. So it's very, if a company is making an outsized return on capital, the world is coming for them. Absolutely. The world is coming for them and they're trying to steal those profits unless the government is somehow preventing competition. Um, so as you have that company with that, with that situation, how do you handicap how durable that is? And if it's. If they're going to make an outsized return on capital for five years and then they're going to decay or even be replaced, they're not worth that much. Maybe they're worth seven times earnings, maybe they're worth 10 times earnings or something. But if they're, do you think they can reliably earn an outsized return on capital and grow their business for you know the next three decades, then they very well may be worth 20 times earnings. So I can't, you know, without... What's the growth rate? Yeah. What's the returns? How, 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 returns. How, yeah. All, all those things, you can't quite answer it just, just hypothetically, but it's really important. Yeah. And what's the leverage? And all of those things. I remember we were talking to, Dow and I were down talking to some students in Alabama. They have a, we give them a plug, but John Hines and, and the Color House Investment Manager Group is something that Dow and I were involved with since its beginning. And C.T. Fitzpatrick created it, but it's been fantastic to watch the growth of that and how a great job the students are doing there and how much it's improved and the outcomes. And it's really a first class group. But I remember they were presenting to us one time, pretty standard model of we're going to project the next five years of earnings. And then we're going to put a terminal multiple on it. And well, 76% of the value of the, the intrinsic value of the business that they were estimating was in this terminal multiple. And our bias is to be explicit about that actually forecast all of the years with the assumption that earnings are going to decay, that the outsized returns are going to capital are going to decay first, and then ultimately the earnings are going to decay. And so if we're, if that's not our base case, we need to really have a lot of confidence in a moat. And I think that you start playing with that math and start thinking about the world that way. And it gets harder and harder to pay 20 plus times earnings for a lot of businesses and they need to have a lot of growth or that you need to have a lot of confidence and the durability of their of their cash flows. Tough thing about that conclusion is it hasn't been the right conclusion looking backwards over the past decade, right? No question about it. No. So well, I, I wish those students well and I tell them all War Eagle, but that is neither here nor there. Full time. <laughs> um no, my follow up was gonna be my my sense is you probably just avoid the the latter scenario of a company that you don't feel like you can forecast, but. Yeah, I mean, what that's well, ultimately what happened. Usually the market, look, there are a lot of businesses that we can forecast 24 months out, but they rarely trade at two times earnings. Yeah. So if we're paying 15 times earnings, we're implicitly saying that we know something about the next 10, 12, 15 years of results of that business. So I'd like for us to know, be able to say that. This is why we think this business is gonna do roughly this over the next 15 years, not over the next two. Cause like, how are we getting our capital back? And then once we get our capital back, how are we getting a return? So I think the net effect is when you don't have that visibility 
and other people may, I mean, there, there are lots of businesses where someone else may have an expertise that allows them to see much farther in the future than we can, but we need to be able to, I want to see all our money coming back. And then I want to see the profits on the other side of that before we invest. And that's, that's how we think about, I mean, that's how we think about buying a private business or some real estate or something else. And so that's, I think that's the intelligent way to think about public investing, public equity investing. I mean, it's a very high bar and it should be right. You wouldn't, you wouldn't walk around buying every business you were offered. So you should probably treat public markets in the same way. What it, it, one thing that I, th I thought was an interesting letter that you, or an action that you mentioned in a letter was when you sold craft. And my perception was that you didn't like the financial engineering decision to separate them and Mondelez. The, the kind of counter that I had in my head was like, well, it was kind of a financially engineered organization to begin with. So what, what about the, the spinoff transaction or the separation offended you a little bit more than the sort of levered return aspect of that business? I didn't like that. I never like it when a company is doing a transaction that's raising their costs because they, because they did, they increased their cost structure just because basically one part of the management team didn't want to own the slow growth piece. Mm. We don't see any numbers on Duracell anymore, but Procter & Gamble, you know, basically gave that business to Berkshire in exchange for a bunch of stock and because they didn't want to own a business that was shrinking slowly. And I just don't like that. I think you ought to be able to, man I mean, I think a, a good manager ought to be able to manage a business that's growing and shrinking both. And I think if they're in roughly the same industry, which was the case with Kraft and Mondelez, you ought to be able to manage those together. I mean, like having more clout with the, gro with the grocery store chains or the supermarket chains should be a positive, even if you have Folgers next to Oreos and one of them is shrinking and one of them is growing. So I don't think it improved the focus of the businesses. I don't think, uh, I just didn't really buy. It, this was completely engineered by an investment banker that said, hey, we can get this big multiple and the piece of this is growing and it's got more emerging market exposure. But I think that the, the underlying businesses were more or less in the same industry and there was plenty of opportunities for them to cross pollinate if they were intelligent about the way they did their comp structure and the way that they did, they managed success. And it may be that Folgers dying slowly was a, was the best outcome that one could hope for, but that's worth fighting for. I mean, you certainly, how long can you keep a business profitable without injecting more capital into it? I mean, like that's, that's a noble goal and it's obviously worth less, but there's nothing wrong with that. And I, I just, the sort of obsession with growth for growth's sake, or, Hey, we're going to get rid of this particular division because it doesn't show growth. I, I really, it's, it's doesn't, I don't like that. Well, I'm sure yeah. internally, or, or at least the pitch was Mondelez will have a lower cost of capital and the aggregate will be worth more, but I don't know. I, I don't know that it's turned out to be a very good decision. I, I haven't really checked. Yeah, I don't know either, actually. And uh, maybe we should run a little post on that. We made some money on that investment, um, obviously, but we sold both of them at the time, same time, actually. Yeah. And we certainly in, interact with Mondelez when I do it, when I'm visiting mom and pops around the world, I see a lot of Mondelez products. I mean, they are, it is a Oreos in particular, are a nice product. Um, yes, they are. They're delicious. Yeah, they are delicious. And I would I often argue to my kids that an Oreo is better than the finest dessert at the finest restaurants. Yeah. I, I mean, I tell you what I've been on lately is the Doritos, the Cool Ranch have entered my house. I wish they never did. But that's like crack. Yeah. I mean, that you know, I know it's a different that. company. I'm just saying the, those two, those two, uh, are the perfect snack foods. Yes. They, yes. They, I can't argue with that. I kind of I do keep them out of my house. Hopefully you have to, I can't stop. You can't stop. Yeah. You can't stop. Well, Pringles might kind of get us in trouble for that, but I agree with you. You can't stop. I guess we never yeah. said you pop. So anyway, that's neither here nor there. Okay. So something I find kind of interesting you have disclosed and it's that, you know, anyone can look, you have an investment in AB InBev and you had the craft investment. I think the narrative on 3G is that they cut to the bone and maybe aren't so customer focused. And you're somebody that's very customer focused. So I'm kind of curious to hear how they, how, why you're comfortable going against the grain in that scenario. Well, maybe I would do revolve the craft of monthlies, I think before 3G was involved. Okay. So. 
but with and as a bunch of that, but we certainly have not covered ourselves in glory with that investment. We're we're close to break even on that, so that has not been a winner for us. So I, I think what we do see outside the U.S. and outside of Europe in particular is that they have a similar dominant position with the mom and pops. For example, in Colombia, they have like ninety five percent market share, so they have some really dominant positions that are really valuable and some really entrenched moats. I think that they. With the exception of the Bud Light fiasco, which hopefully we can skip over, I think they have done a pretty good job with their customers, with their consumers, actually. They've innovated a lot of, when they saw the craft beer thing happening in the United States, which doesn't really, can't really happen in Latin America in the same way because of the route to market. They started innovating beer with more flavor and created a bunch of products and a bunch of their markets that have been very successful in this sort of premium space for the customer that wanted a different type of beer. And I think they satisfied that consumer intelligently and well and prevented competition that way by not leaving crumbs out there. I think one of the big things they got wrong in the stock price and why, you know, part of the reason for our result is that they thought they were saving money by borrowing. They noticed that the euro was correlated to emerging market currencies relative to the dollar. So they borrowed a lot of money in euro. They had a leverage balance sheet when they bought SAB, obviously. Um, and they borrowed in euro. And I think they assumed that that, because it was it historically had been correlated with currencies in Latin America, that that would work out okay. But then that correlation broke down. And the euro strengthened a lot against the currencies in Latin America where they, had, they were actually earning most of their profits. And so they were effectively very short the dollar, both. On the leverage side, they were shorted on their COG side, and they were shorted on their sales when they got pulled back into U.S. dollars. So they're all three ways they were really leveraged short the dollar, and the dollar rallied a lot. And I think that execution hasn't been perfect, although I think it's been pretty good. I think they actually executed their way through COVID better than any of the other big brewers. And I think that they have really terrific moats in a lot of their markets that are uh, quite durable and are really valuable. I dream one day of the Coke bottlers and the, and the brewers getting together in more mergers mm. because then you'd have sort of 50% share and, and these mom and pops and you could eliminate a bunch of costs. So I think there are a lot of opportunities, but they're being very levered and levered short with the mismatch on the currency, effectively short the dollar in a period when the dollar really rallied. I think that really hurt them. And and perhaps some of the 3G success was less maybe than it was reported, but in part because they were levered, they were also at the time kind of levered short the dollar when the dollar didn't do well. Hmm. And so I think that sort of carry trade currency piece of it is maybe was a bigger part of their success initially and bigger headwind to their success more recently. It's interesting to think about. well understood. My perception was that they just kind of got to the a couple N plus one acquisitions that just got too big. Like if they could own Corona in the U S and they didn't have to sell that, that would be huge. And then they had to divest to so many brands and they bought SAB that but just kind of, and then, and then you're buying something at a premium and everybody knows you're a forced seller. And especially with Corona, there was only like really one logical player to sell it to. The story would be way different if they own Corona in the U S way different. <laughs> It'd be better if they'd hold on, held on to Corona Modelo and sold Bud Light. Yes. But that was not obvious at the time. Now, we years ago on Modelo, Grupo Modelo, back when it would, uh, when Inez Bajimbo had a stake in it, but it was a standalone company. And part of the thesis of our buying it was the growth of Corona, particularly at the time in the United States. This is back yeah. in 06 or something. So unbelievable that Modelo is now the number one beer in the US. That's a crazy outcome. But it's a good beer, though. So, and I, endorse everyone drinking it whenever they're outside the United States. But, uh, <laughs> but here, um, here by Bud Light or some random regional craft beer that AB and Bet bought. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but we didn't buy it till after that transaction. Um, but we, anyway, I look, it's, it's been not one that we cover ourselves in glory, but I think that most of the money that we lost and we're kind of break even, but most of the money that we should have made has been a result of the dollar strengthening so much and they're being kind of levered short at three different ways. Yeah. Well, I pitched it way higher and thankfully I sold at a decent time. I didn't get too killed on it, but I, 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 I like the entity. I just, one, somebody said to me, 
once about the, the acquisition of craft brewing companies. He said, the problem is it's kind of like when, and, and I know that phase is over, but he said, it's kind of like when you buy a new car on the second that AB InBev buys a craft brewer and kind of like tanks in value. Now, I don't, I'm sure the financials aren't this, the same as the brand perception, but craft brewing is interesting. I've, I've found it's one of those, those industries or products that there's like a really good scale and then they get too big and it's just really hard to make good beer at scale. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Maybe that's just my mind. Yeah. I would say several years ago, I went to the craft beer conference in uh, Denver and I sort of didn't shave for a few days and put on a t-shirt and tried to kind of, I could see you, you could like, you could like pull it off if you were bearded. If I was bearded, I tried to look like I was interested in starting a craft beer Yeah, and basically just walked around the convention floor. Yeah. Like a Metallica to, shirt or something. Um, I had a, a local craft beer shirt there you go. That a works. friend that has a, if I got to buy the, all the machinery, I got to buy hops, I got to buy uh, barley, I got to, how would I go about doing this in the yeast? And you had all the different booths and you talk to them and pretty clear. I mean, craft beer, a third, but probably 25% of American beer drinkers want to drink beer that tastes like, you know, what I would call beer, like some sort of European version of beer that has a lot of flavor. That's maybe it's a third, but maybe it's a little less. And no one really was, was answering that demand other than imports. Hmm. So there was an opportunity because systematically over the decades, Miller Lite, Coors Light, Bud Light, Budweiser had gotten more increasingly bland. That had been basically, the, they'd taken flavor out of the beer for 40 years hmm. each year. And so there was an opportunity there. There was an unmet consumer demand. And then secondly, with the way the three-tier distribution works in the U.S., Everybody was able to piggyback off the scale of the big brewers to get to market. And of course that doesn't, that's a, you know, a accident of prohibition in the United States that we were set up that way in 49 States, but nowhere else in the world does that exist. So there's not, you can't create a craft beer in Brazil and get to market on the, on the Ambad truck or on the Heineken truck. You got to get to market yourself, which means you can't. So, you know, the craft beer was selling at a premium. This is very profitable initially for these distributors and there wasn't much craft beer. So they were very happy to add it to their trucks and, and go make money on it. But then once there are a lot of craft beer companies, then they were no longer able to demand uh, the pricing from the distributors. And so basically they turned into rest the restaurant business and you can make money at your craft. You, you need to be able to make money at your brewery yep. as a bar. Um, otherwise you can't make it. Yeah. And, uh, and so I think that's the future, which probably means there's less craft beers than there are now, but, and, but the cost difference is like, I'm working off old numbers, but I want to say it was like 60, the large brewers are like in the 60, 60 something cents per liter. And the craft beer was $2. Yeah. Well, the prices that you pay as a consumer show it. Yeah. I mean, the, but the, but still, I mean, like. The prices you pay as a consumer are less different than the cost. Of yeah, the margins difference. are tighter, no doubt. On craft, and, yeah. Uh, so that makes it very, very hard. And so I think the other cheat is that, um, and I think this is an interesting thing as, as beer tastes are developing, it's much harder to make a lager than it is to make an IPA. Oh, interesting. You know, that's, that's why there's so many IPAs, I guess. That's why there's, yeah. I mean, with an IPA, it's sort of designed to be able to survive in India you know, oh. back at 150 years ago. So you throw a lot of hops in it to basically disguise whatever mistakes you make in the brewing process. Huh. And so, and, and look, there are consumers that want that. I'm one of them. I just, I just didn't realize Good. that was why. Interesting. And so, but when you try to make a lager, it's a, you're much more careful about the temperatures and the yeast and all the different pieces that go into it. And I'm not an expert, but much more difficult to make a lager and keep it from being skunk or something because huh. you can't really hide it if you do. So as this growing sort of craft beer session beers that you're seeing, which it's harder to do that. And so it's more likely to me that someone like Modelo who's doing that at scale is making a good session beer is going to grab that share at the expense of the craft beer makers. They're just set up to be, you can't just like basically know how to make beer in the kitchen and make a good lager. Interesting. It's pretty tough. Session beers are a good so. concept. 
right? Not a light beer. I don't have to feel like I'm wimpy drinking it, but it's got like the right amount of alcohol that I can drink it and not get bombed. Yeah. Well, beer's a good, good, good idea, period. Yeah. I tell you what, I'm kind of at the age where I can't handle it anymore. If nothing else, my belly just grows and grows. So alas, opens up some potentially dangerous, uh, you know, can't go down a tequila path just because I can't handle beer. Otherwise, things can get off the rails. But that's neither here nor there. Can we talk about your your investment in Jumbo and and that business? And I wish I wish that there was a way. I, I I'll try to put a picture up or something. But the way that you described, like when you're going up the escalator, how that that particular retailer has scattered tchotchkes all up and down the escalator. To, to sort of like get your mind to impulse buy. I love that that story of how you bought that business. And then I'm pretty sure you exited, but I, I like that that investment quite a bit. Yeah. So when, when you know, when the Greek crisis happened back in, was it 2011 or 12, we, I went to Greece, met with a bunch of companies, tried to figure out if there was anything here that was mispriced and that might be interesting because the, the country was completely bombed out and there was good fears about a recession and falling out of the Euro and all of those things were happening. Jumbo was a business that we looked at then and admired. We admired the management team. The owner is, is, is fantastic. He's so awesome and such an interesting manager. And they basically just buy, they were, they buy products in Asia. And at that point it was mostly China and they bring them back and put them in a store. They have, there's a toy store, but it's more than a toy store. We don't really have an equivalent to it in America. So I don't know exactly how to, but. It seems you know, like a definitely really built... big, well merchandised Dollar Tree, for lack of a better term. Yeah, I would say that's right. Yeah, I was at a similar format in the UK last week, and it has something similar. It's like a large format Dollar Tree, Dollar General. Yeah, with no food. That, that's, that's fair. And uh, yeah, and they have like escalator, and they just put the stuff. I've actually seen the same technique in Shanghai when I was there back in wait, but they just, there's, you're on the escalator, you're stuck there. Why not put some things there that you can grab? Yeah. And, and you got the kids with you and of course the kids can grab it. <laughs> and now what's the mom going to do? And so, but they're, yeah, um, you're not, you're not having your kid put down the dollar toy to have them scream yeah. for the rest of the time. That's not going to happen. Right. And, and the disorder of that is actually part of the fun. I remember like the original idea of Toys R Us is like, let's let put toys in the aisle and let's let them fall. The kids knock them over. That's like part of it. Yeah. And so there's a certain aspect of that too, as well. But I love how the management, the, the, the owner is so systematically conservative. He's like, well, we don't know what's going to happen down the road. We know this is working now. It could get worse. And then they're like consistently beat. They're at kind of whatever, they don't really give guidance, whatever kind of guidance they give you, they consistently beat it and they run with no leverage and they're expanding in Romania and, and they don't really have a lot of competition from Amazon in, in that part of the world. That's something to pay attention to. But well, I guess 2022, the stock got back down it because there were fears about being with COVID. They're not being able to bring in the products from China that they were in, in Southeast Asia that where they were getting them. And the cost of bringing things in was going up and they're, oh, the, the model's permanently damaged. So, okay, well, they started a share buyback program. I mean, this is a very conservative management team that only is only going to buy back stock because they think it's cheap. Not one that's just running a share buyback program because that's what they're supposed to do. So we started picking off some shares kind of right at or right slightly above the share buyback level. And then, you know, the model still worked and they sort of get out of the COVID inventory and uh, supply chain issues and the stock was up. I can't remember. Maybe it was up over hundred percent and we got to long-term capital gain status and we exited. I mean, I, I don't, I do think there are some challenges. That's a lot of key man risk in that business, but you know, the, I mean, it is a nice niche business that works. It wouldn't probably wouldn't work in the U S probably wouldn't work everywhere, but it does work in their and they're region quite well and, and they're conservative about it. And so really a, a nice business and maybe we'll get a chance again, you know? So, yeah. You, when you sent me a, I don't know, you'd send me like your write up and then I started reading some transcripts. That guy that runs it is like a really cool person to read. Yeah. I just love it when you get that level of frankness. Yes. When they, this is our problem. This is our challenge. We're not sure that how it's going to work out. Like that's makes me want to invest like that level of frankness from a manager is, is something that we'd love to see. I mean, I almost 
want to just close my eyes, not even look at the price and want to buy it. But that's of course not what you do. <laughs> you do have to, I have a number of companies on our watch list that I met with a guy and I won't reveal the name because I do want to buy the stock at some point, but I met with him and he said, he said, do not buy my stock. It's too expensive right here. <laughs> it's awesome. He, you know, I was supposed to meet with the CFO and I, I walk in and he came in and introduced himself. I kind of missed his name when he walked in and he said, oh, I'm sorry, the CFO is sick. You'll have to meet with me. And I didn't really fully understand it was a CEO. It's about five minutes into the conversation. This is the first meeting with the company. And he, anyway, but he's like, yeah, you don't want to buy my stock. He's like, large investment banks are saying everything in Africa is cheap. Like that's nonsense. I've been operating in Africa for 40 years and you need to get paid back quickly if you're investing in Africa. Oh, interesting. You know? Yeah. So this is, I can't remember how long ago that was, 10 years ago or so. And he's like, so don't buy my stock now. It's too expensive. What's the stock done and since? Like, it hasn't done that well. There you go. He was right. I mean, I think they've ably managed it, but the, the macro headwinds and in South Africa and around their region where they were selling have been very tough. That's sort of his but point. But he also right? said, yeah, he also talked about the brain drains. Like I, I have good people. I send them to the U.S. to get an MBA and they never come back. Huh. You know, and that's really a, that's a challenge. That was like his biggest challenge was retaining talent in addition to the consumer, the macro situation there. So, but I just, he didn't know. It's interesting. A lot of times when you meet a really good manager, they, they'll reference some things that you and I would talk about. But he didn't seem to know any of that. He just knew how to run a business. Like he, he had to learn that by copying Warren Buffett or something. He just knew it and it just was coming out of him. Hmm. And, and anyway, I regret that we've never owned it and that we've never made any money off of that. But I, every now and then you run across a manager like that, that's, you know, whether you want to call it old school or just like they see their business the way that as an entrepreneur and not as the way they're supposed to package it for theoretically how some finance person expects to receive it. Well, I'll tell you what, what has messed me up is I used to be the person that was like, oh, I'm looking for people that write like Buffett. Now, if I see somebody that writes like Buffett, I'm like, ah, this is probably a promote. I don't know. I don't like this, <laughs> which it's hard. It's kind of I mean, like, this is either somebody I really agree with and I should listen, or it's somebody I think is totally full of crap. And I don't know. Yeah. I think you see people that quote Buffett, but don't actually write like him. Yeah. Like they're, they're, they're trying to tie themselves to that brand, but they're not, they don't have the insight and they don't have the frankness and they don't have the sort of obvious honesty that comes through in Buffett's writing. And so that's what I'm trying to hear when I read someone is, are they quoting these ideas because they, they heard them somewhere or do they, is it really in their bones? Is it who they are? Did, does your, your travels and how you. I mean, just like hearing you rattle off just in this conversation, how many places you've been. I mean, does putting eyes on somebody and talking to them, is that how you help yourself understand how they actually think? And and are they just sort of marketing versus do they believe what they're saying? I don't know any other way to do it. I mean, maybe I think you always want to learn what the company says is happening. And then I think you want to find as many ways to independently verify that as possible. And so if a company says they're doing something, they're doing X, well, we may not be able to test that. But if they're saying they're doing Y, well, let's go test it. I can remember I was on one of these investor days in Eastern Europe and a company, they'd set up, clearly set up four stores for all the analysts to go through. And, and they said, oh, this is how we do it. This is how we execute mm -hmm. in these stores and look at, look at this. This is great. I'm like, oh, you know, good. And then I went to, I went to 20 other stores and had a totally different experience. Hmm. Actually, didn't, I thought they were executing fine, but it was nothing like the stores that they clearly had rigged for Analyst Day, which, I don't know, that tells you something about, you know. Do you want to partner team. with that? Yeah, maybe they weren't even, you know, in that case, I, I like the CEO. I don't think they were kind of being explicitly dishonest, but it was definitely like a razzle-dazzle show. So we're... We trust, but verify or whatever. I'd like to go back and ask them questions and maybe they have a good answer. You know, Hey, the local guy got a little carried away. He knew the CEO was coming. Yeah. And so he wanted to show off for the CEO and he got carried away. That really wasn't a dictate for me, which is fair, but how, what do they say? How do they say it? How do they used to say it? I think that's something important is to look at way they described their business five years ago and what they thought the challenges were. And if it's roughly the same management team and it's not simple, but you're trying to get at, 
your level of confidence in, in their ability to forecast. And then I like to ask them, what are the things that if they went against you could really hurt your business? You know, what are the things that you're really worried about? And I think I heard anecdotally that Bill Ray used to ask companies, you know, how would you go bankrupt? Hmm. Um, I used to ask that. I tried asking that for a little while and I got so many blank stares. They were just confused by that. <laughs> and I kind of thought maybe I was, I could ask it a different way and without damaging them, like kind of putting them on their heels so much. But yeah, it's, it's, you got to go be there in person. You got to go into their marketplace. You got to talk to their customers and their suppliers and their, their peers around the world, their competitors in their, in their country and see if what they're saying that they're doing matches what you're able to observe. And frequently it doesn't, but sometimes it does. Yeah. Sometimes they're lying and sometimes they're just fooling themselves, but the net result is the same for you as an investor. I like that. That, that should be a quote. We're going to, we're going we're gonna to put that up on a, uh, on okay. the YouTube right. thumbtail or whatever. Yeah. When you said what you said about South Africa and Greece had the, the crisis and just what I experienced when I was in Costa Rica it just seemed very dependent upon tourism and sort of maybe a pro-cyclical aspect to what what's going on. How do you think about the valuation disconnect between some of these emerging market countries and and some more developed countries and whether what's justified? within that versus what's not justified. I mean, surely if you look at history, I think we're like at a 50 year, you know, 50 year divergence in valuations between one, one metric I saw this week between emerging markets in the U S I think you're 10, 15 years on di different metrics. I mean, we're, we're to, and not just against emerging markets, but against the whole rest of the world. And I don't know that that's not going to get bigger. I'm not making a forecast, but you need to have pretty rosy assumptions about growth in the U.S. for it to outperform, you know, the rest of these places. But we're we're trying to find individual businesses that end up back to owning, you know, eight to ten companies at a time. I don't necessarily have to believe that Coast. I mean, we don't. We actually own a small. One of our businesses has a subsidiary in Costa Rica, but it's not that important. Um, but I don't necessarily have to believe that Costa Rica is going to be really successful for us to make money. So it's kind of like with this individual business, with their current level of profitability, what are the risks that it gets better or worse? And what are those things and how likely are they to happen? And if I'm buying that at four or five times earnings, maybe uh, there's a, there's a level of uncertainty I'm willing to tolerate. If I'm paying 15 or 20, I'm probably not willing to tolerate that uncertainty. Will you hedge um, the currency exposure or are you fully unhedged? We are unhedged. We have the ability to hedge the currency. We actually got a couple, only a couple times that we really got close to doing that. But typically we, a lot of our companies have hedges internally. A lot of companies have, we look at what percentage of their COGS are in local. We also look at how they're financed. Most of our companies have very little leverage or, or no leverage when that's important too. And then what is their pricing power? You look at our Turkish business, we've raised prices above inflation consistently over the last several years, and we're making record profits in Turkey. Hmm. So 70 plus percent inflation or whatever the latest numbers are in Turkey, we've been able to out, we've been able to grow profits faster than that because we've raised revenue wow. faster. So should we have hedged it? I mean, it's almost basically impossible to hedge the Turkish lira. Yeah. So I think the answer to that is different for different businesses. And maybe if a business has got a bunch of leverage implicit in when they have a mismatch on their current, on their leverage and on where they're, you know, where they're earning money and where they're paying debt, well, you probably, we tend to not want to get involved. We prefer, you know, back to the controlling shareholder. Usually when the business has got controlling shareholders, there is not a lot of leverage in it because, you know, if you've learned if you're a, I don't know, a Mexican investor and you've made a lot of, you're made a lot of money, you've seen a lot of crises and you don't want to, you want to. You want to be able to keep your seat, your, your chip in your chair. And if you have a bunch of leverage, you're A, not able to survive the inevitable volatility that's going to happen, but also you're not able to take advantage of that. And I would say that one theme that we have maybe is kind of thinking about being a counter cyclical 
investor and investing in businesses that have the mentality where they're thinking about how to expand their business when things are bad. Peter Kaufman's been a, a tremendous mentor for us, and he always talks about how he pays his bills faster when things slow down, and he he wants to be the employer of choice for people that are thinking start to get nervous about their job at the competitor at his competitors. You know, when things slow down, like and he if he can afford to, he'll make an order to be with a supplier hmm. to help that supplier in those situations. Because then later, when they really need the help of that supplier, they have a very loyal relationship, and so. If you are able to, if you have capital or are able to deploy it when there is panic, that can, that's a, that's a durable competitive advantage also. And particularly in places that don't have the same sort of central bank backstop that we're used to in the United States. Hmm. I like that. I went out to see Peter once. That was fun. I should, I should do that again. If I ever get invited, I don't know that he'll invite me back. We'll see. I pushed back on something once, but it was, it was, it was a friendly debate. That he wanted. He's a remarkable guy and very involved in a charity here in Alabama, actually, right. in my mom's hometown. But I've known him long before that. And he's a really an amazing manager and amazing, amazing um, at people and how to motivate them and how to make them feel loved and how to, you know, build teams and so many things to, to learn from Peter. Yeah. How has building an investment firm been for you? You know, it's, it's an interesting pursuit. And I, I got to meet at least one, I think two of your team members at Markel, but definitely one. Just kind of curious. I, I just had Bruce Berkowitz on and he'd mentioned that that was an area that he did not succeed in. And I'm just kind of curious how you, how you've worked on developing your team. Well, I guess I'll go all the way back to the, maybe the beginning of the business. Dal Bynum and I moved home from New York. We got a three bedroom apartment and we started the business in the third bedroom. So our mentality has always been we're entrepreneurs and this is a startup. And let's stay very hungry. Let's think about what our burn rate is. Let's see how, how long we could stay in business if we were to lose our biggest customer or two biggest customers or whatever. And let's be really careful about every dollar we spend, make sure we're getting a positive ROI on that. And we've been fortunate to have wonderful people that came along in the business with us at different points. And our first person that ever joined us is Lynn Owens, and she's still here. And she's been a tremendous part of the team now for, I don't know, 15 or more years, um, right? Maybe 18 years now, just thinking back. And, but we're, Dow and I would always, I think we even wrote about this one time, but we would always question each other. We started working on learning things together in elementary school, really, and teaching each other things and questioning each other and challenging each other. And we never had an argument, but we were always uh, pushing each other and kind of looking at things. Oh, we could learn that. And like, let, let's go. Do you really know that, Richard? And uh, or do you not know that? And so when we started thinking about institutionalizing that as a team, we wanted to have that in the culture. You know that that everybody you have know, a very flat organization. Tell people why if you if you ask them to do something, have them give you feedback. And so I would say we've had been very fortunate to have work with wonderful people throughout the, the whole period here. So it's been a very supportive to me in difficult personal times and in difficult work times. Oh, you want to hire smart people and you want to hire people that think like, think like owners and the decisions they make, but also always put our clients first. Like we want them to always be thinking about what would the, what's best for the client and how can we do this better for our clients? And so you have to ask some of them, I guess, and to assess that, but hopefully, I mean, I feel very proud of the of the people that are here and the people that have made big contributions here in the past. Very cool. Well, I have enjoyed getting to know you. Shout out to our mutual friend, David, for the uh, the introduction. And it's been fun, man. Absolutely. I, I hope that this was an enjoyable use of your time. I'm going to get you out of here on time. Um, and, you know, thank you very much for joining the show. Well, thank you. Thanks for what you're doing. Thanks to David for putting this together. I owe a lot to David for sure. And I'm hoping to talk again soon. All right, man. I look forward to it. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.